Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Dean, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Dean. Hi, everyone. Um, good to be here. Yeah, today is my AA birthday. I'm celebrating nine months. I completely forgot that it was my AA birthday until like it was two weeks into the date. Someone else said, oh, isn't that here? And I'm like, ah. Ah, so that's why I'm wearing a cape. Um, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, um, I'm really glad I made it into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, it's not something, you know, I, my sobriety date isn't the first day that I got into, uh, AA. Uh, it took me a while to realize that, that there's certain things that I needed to do for my solution. Um, my drinking ended with me throwing up all over myself in the middle of a Thanksgiving, uh, party. Um, I, I love it because, like, I was reading a section from uh, Living Sober, and it had it talked about uh, going to parties and drinking uh, buttered rums. And I'm like, that's what I was throwing up on. <laughs> you know, that was me. So um, I was embarrassed by this situation, unlike the other situations, because it was in front of people that I loved and people I was trying to impress, which, you know, my ego is super important. And... Um, what 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 happened after is I decided I was going to take a little break. Uh, I was supposed to take like a a break until my birthday. I lasted about six days and in complete de- defeat. Like I I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I heard the story of a of a um, a gentleman that's in the program who I see regularly now, uh, and. It was my story, you know, I wanted to kill myself, I wanted to, I didn't find that there was anything for me to live for, and um, that's one of the reasons why I kept drinking, because it just gave me a a reason to continue my day, or get through the day, you know, it was was that thing that helped. Um, When I started out here, I didn't really feel like I belonged, I... I saw everyone was, you know, more clean cut and everyone had like their lives a lot more together than I had my life. So I, you know, I thought that these people can be like me. These people aren't like me. Um, and you know, there was, there wasn't that enough black people there. You know, it was just like every reason there's not enough gay people. I went to gay meetings. You know, I just don't feel comfortable in the gay meetings. It was just always something that was, like, the reason why AA wasn't going to work for me. And um, I kept going because it felt better going rather than not going. And that was that was the one thing that kept me going. And the third tradition really stuck me, kept me coming back into these rooms because that was the only thing I could I could agree with, you know. The only requirement is desire to stop drinking, and I had that. Maybe I can stick around. And, um, I be working the steps with my sponsor and, um, and finding out a little bit more about myself, you know, I had a sponsor who I was reading the big book first and they weren't really reading with me. I wasn't doing anything with them. Uh, and I was doing drugs also while staying sober and so, like, my, my sobriety with uh, marijuana maintenance, occasional, you know, acid dropping. <laughs> and, yeah, it, 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 I realized that there was something wrong, not, not when I picked up a 24-hour chip, like, dropping on, uh, dropping on acid, but when I got really high um, on my birthday and I felt really uncomfortable with it. And I felt really pressured into doing it. So, um... You know, I told my sponsor about that, and, and you know, he told me that I needed to change my sobriety date, which really, I was like, you know, like, I don't see what the point is. It's like, I, like my real problem is alcohol. And then he was just like, to my own self, be true. And I had to really sit back and think that about my history with drugs, and it, there's always been drugs or alcohol 
in my life. You know, if they're, if not together, they were, they were keeping me together. And so, um, I became, I got more desperate. I, um, went to a lot of meetings. I called people. I took suggestions from everyone that I saw. You know, someone said, Hey, why don't you write, write a gratitude list since you're in such a bad mood all the time? And, you know, I was like, well, you know, you don't understand why I'm in a bad mood, but I'll give it a try. And I still make gratitude lists. I send them to people. I'm, I make them when I'm having the worst days. I make them when I'm having the best days. And, you know, it's, it's teaching me something about my experience in life is that I'll, I'll, it always will be something that I feel like I can get a little bit more to make it better. And, you know, it's, it's just not right yet. It needs to be just a little bit more, you know, if, if there was only ice cream also in this situation, if there was only, you know, 10 hot guys also in this situation, I would be perfect. And it's just like all those little add-ons and all those little things that I had in my life. When I got, when I, when it came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a job, I had a, I had a partner, um, I had, I had money saved in my bank account, you know, I didn't have a higher power, I didn't have a spiritual solution, um, I didn't know how to stop drinking, and now I don't have the job, I don't have the boyfriend, I still have my apartment though, I'm being taken care of. Um, I have a spiritual solution and I'm not like, and I don't, I don't want to kill myself in the same way I wanted to kill myself in the beginning. Yeah, I don't, I don't want that. I really want to figure out some way to like make my life work and make my life, continue my life, living it. And, um, sobriety hasn't been easy. Like, um, I, I've dealt with grief and sobriety. One of my one of my close friends in this program uh, took his life because uh, he just couldn't he couldn't bear it. And the sad news for me is that I could relate to that. And um, also, when it when it comes down to relating to that pain, you know, we talked about suicide all the time. So like it was something that we talked about because I you know it was in my mind too. And um, one thing I'm learning now in this program, and, you know, if you stick around long enough, definitely, you know, you realize how many people actually really do care about you and how your life can just improve, you know. Um, it's not really the life that I want right now. I, you know, ooh, thank you. And, and like, um, it's not the life that I want for myself. But it is, it is a life better than I could have imagined. Um, I didn't, I can, uh, like, everything in my life has led me, led me to alcohol related things. I, I was a bartender for 10 years because it was the best career to me. It was the best thing that I can do with my time. And now I have this opportunity. I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. I don't know what's going to, I don't know what the future holds. But I, I'm happy to say that if I don't want it to have alcohol in its, in its, in its picture. Um, I have a better connection with my mom in the, in this last year. I've been able to like talk to my mother. You know, I, I had to go to the hospital recently and that was like a scary thing, but it was where I needed to go. And I was able to talk to my mom about these things that, that are going on with my life. And my mom wants to see me and she, you know, she wasn't worried in this way that she would worry about me before because she knew it. She had no idea what was going on in my life. I kept everything secret. So um, I'm happy. Uh, that's one of the biggest uh, gifts I've gotten so far in sobriety of having this connection with my mother that I didn't have before. And... Um, the fact that my mother cannot be worried about me and also, you know, wonder how I'm doing. I'm like, I didn't know that those two things could happen at the same time. I always thought it was just my mother was going to worry about me. And so I wouldn't pick up the phone and I'd be annoyed by it. By it. Um, more recently, um, like I'm on, yeah, thank you. I'm on step, 
<laughs> I'm on. <laughs> I am working with steps. So I am on. I'm on step ten right now. Um, taking a personal inventory, and also ten, eleven, twelve. I'm doing those. All, all three of those, but I'm really on ten right now and trying to get that practice uh, good and clean. Um, it's been it's been a journey. It's been really good. I need to meditate in order to like get a little bit more of a closer contact. I really don't understand some of the some of the things that I'm meditating for, um, but it does work in the end, you know. And I'm just gonna stop there. I just got really distracted by the <laughs> minute signal. <laughs> I'm Tony. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Tony. So it's really good to be here tonight. Um, I spoke here a couple of years ago. I like this room. It gives me good memories. Um, so yeah, thank you. First off, thanks. I'm so glad that you're here, and um, I'm really glad. If you're new, welcome, welcome home. Uh, if it's not your first rodeo, welcome back. Glad that you're here. This is the last fucking house on the block. So, real quick, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. I have a sobriety date. It's January 6, 1993. Oh, wow. I got sober when I hit, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, trust me, I know. I look in the mirror, and sometimes I'm like, whoa, buddy, you are not 17 anymore. <laughs> um, as a uh, benefit of being in sobriety, I've lived to be, four, I'm, I'm going to be 44 this year, which is weird. Because I, I, was, I was convinced that I'd be dead by the time I was 18. Because 18 was the year that had, they had told me as a child that I, I, no matter what, I had to move out. And whether that meant being homeless, it didn't matter. But when I turned 18, I had to go. And because that's how bad, that's how bad I was when I was a kid. So uh, what, what, what happened was I... I I was born in a small valley town in, in Visalia. I don't know if you guys know where that is in the Central Valley. Um, Visalia has got, there's, you either are raising cattle or picking fruit or, you know, doing meth. That's really your choices. <laughs> um, so, you laugh, but it's true. <laughs> Those are my options. And uh, I didn't really take any 4 H classes, so. You know, the, and, and the sad thing is, is that the med thing wasn't going to work for me because from the time I was about third or fourth grade, uh, I was put on Deceptamine, Amipramine, Dexedrine, and Ritalin uh, because, you know, meth bottoms me out. Like, stimulants bottom me out. So uh, it has the exact opposite, you know, effect on my system. And... Other kids would want to take my pills, you know, let me get your fucking riddle and let me get your Adderall. <laughs> they'd be like all hopped up and like zipping around the, 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 uh, the playground. So anyway, um, but before I, I was prescribed those pills to behave or to help me focus, uh, I, I grew up fighting a lot, um, pu pu pulling people's clothes off on the playground, um, uh, just doing, thinking, thinking something and doing it and not really having a, a break in between the thought and the action. And, uh, so I got sent home a lot. I was constantly in trouble at home, stealing stuff, breaking stuff. And I kind of never had an excuse for it, right? Like, of course, people would say, well, he's, he's hyperactivity disorder. He's got an ADHD. He's got this, he's got mental health diagnosis. But that didn't really work for me. I just felt like I was broken. And even before any of that stuff came out, like when I was really young, I, I never really felt like I fit in anywhere. I felt odd. I felt like like I was alien at Thanksgiving. I'd be behind my gra my arthritic grandmother in a wheelchair, being like behind her. I'm like, Mom, Mom, look! Like, you know, like jerking off my grandmother's head on the back of her head. And, like, my mom would be giggling, laughing her ass off. And, you know, it's just not right. I wasn't right, you know? And so, um, and that was just like the tip of the iceberg. Anyway, what, what happened was I ended up getting, going to these child psychiatrists and going to therapists and all this shit. And then when I found alcohol, I was like, oh, now I have an excuse for my behavior. 
Twitter. Like, I can destroy everything. Like, it's totally fine. I could go to this person's house, kick holes in their walls, put the fucking microwave oven through the wall, find dad's shotgun, find a chainsaw, an axe, whatever, and chase everybody around the house with complete abandon because I'm drunk. <laughs> right? Like, I wanted to do that stuff, and I knew that stuff wasn't okay, but when I found alcohol and drugs, I was like, now I have an excuse, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I was, like, really, really happy with alcohol and really, really happy with acid and, like, everything else. Like, anything you could give me, I would just want more. Like, give me, give me, give me, give me. I was like Pac-Man. Um... I remember one time I'd made a half ass attempt to stay sober and I'd gone over to some girlfriend's house and she was giving me a tour and we walked past her bed, her uh, brother's bedroom and she opens the door and I see a pipe. I like walk in this dude's room, grab the pipe, light up and I'm all, what was that? And it was like some kind of like crack or something. I don't know. It was like mixed with weed or whatever. And I didn't even think about it. I just did it. She's like, what are you doing in my brother's bedroom? I'm all, in this pipe. Like, oh my God. <laughs> 11, 12 years old. She was just like ripping some teenager's pipe. I don't know what's in it. Uh, might be fun. So, um, and there were like a bunch of times that I would wake up, you know, people say fun, fun with problems, then, then just problems. Um, I, I woke up a couple times in trees, like, I don't know how I got in the tree, we took a bunch of mushrooms, and then another time I, I woke up handcuffed to a fence, covered in puke, not like, why, why am I covered in puke, and pee, whose pee is this, oh my god, like, came you from a fence, like, <laughs> handcuffed to the fence, and then this girl was like, yeah, we hung, and handcuffed you to the fence, because you were puking, and you were gonna choke on it, and we didn't want you to die laying on this cot in the backyard. Well, I was like, why was I in the backyard? Where was everybody else? <laughs> there was a lot of times, like, why was I in the shed by myself? Why was I in the cot in the backyard? Why was left in this room? Like, what happened? Oh, well, you went for my dad's gun. Oh, well, you grabbed the, the axe, and you were, you were fighting with Rusty, or you were fighting with Jerry, or you were fighting with... I was like, oh, God. So it was constantly, like, in having problems drinking. And what happened was, you know, like a good alcoholic, I drank too much, right? And then I got depressed. And in that depression, I, I, I was suicidal. And I became suicidal. I wanted to kill myself. And so I ended up in the psych ward. Uh, they kept me for 11 weeks. And I was like 12 years old, well, 13 year old. And uh, 11 weeks in, this, in the psych ward. And I got out of the psych ward vowing never again to touch alcohol or drugs. I promise I'll. And, you know, God bless my fucking parents. They tried so hard. They tried everything. Like, we'll do, like, a, a reward system. We'll give you a little book. You can put ticks in it for all the good stuff you do. And I was like, good stuff? What? I don't care about good stuff. I just, I don't want to talk to you. Like, I remember I punched so many holes in my walls, like, one time. Like, my whole room was just, like, a wreck. It was a total, like, sty. And finally, my dad got sick, and he put that bulletproof uh, siding that they put on houses on the inside of my fucking room. <laughs> so I'd punch the wall, and I'd be like, no, ah! I'm like, <laughs> cut my knuckles out, and like, try to kick as hard as I could. And like, there he goes, trying to put a hole in the wall. He's not going to do it. It's, it's, it's housing, outside house housing, you know? And uh, so, I mean, I'm like 13, 14 years old, just like going to have, you know? My, room, my knuckles bleeding, I'm screaming, beating my head against the wall. And so, uh, the second time I tried to commit suicide, um, I ended up in the psych ward for a month this time and got out of the psych ward and went to go live with my biological father. Still drinking, so, and his wife wasn't having my BS, so I got to live in the backyard in the tent for a while. And, um, I was going my hair long, you know, I was cool. I was like, cool, you know, weird. I thought it was so cool. Oh, my God. I had these funky, I don't even know where I got these houndstooth bell-bottom pants. <laughs> with some busted out, busted out on the bottom of Birkenstocks. The cork was worn out, right? And this funky, dirty-ass, cigarette-burned tie-dye shirt, and I had super long hair and some, like, dirt on my chin. I had, like, and a little dirt mustache. I thought it was so cool. <laughs> I'm in the bushes smoking clubs, stealing money for beer, like, you know, running around the neighborhood with the little gang member dudes or like, hey, we're gonna go do a drive-by. I'm like, no, I'm cool, bro, but do you got any more sherm? What's up? You know, like, let's go get high. No, we're gonna go mess up these guys. I'm like, I'm cool, hit me when you're done, and I'll be in the bushes, bro. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I got kicked out of high school, kicked out of continuation school, then I got kicked out of the, the community school where the, all the, like, real bad kids go. I got kicked out of high school. I didn't finish high school. <laughs> Very sad state of affairs. In and out of juvie. <clears throat> and so the last time what happened was I went to the psych ward on a suicide attempt. 
and that was it. No one was having my shit anymore. That was it. I burned every bridge, and uh, cool. I'm not doing a drunk log. And um, I got. I like to remember this stuff because I forget. I really do. I like 26 years sober. You forget how bad it was. And um, and I think that's why I get weird before I speak because like to remember all that stuff brings up a lot of stuff, right? And you, no matter how many times you do the steps one, two, three, one through twelve, no matter how many times you go through it cyclically over and over and over and unco- uh, uncover you know all the layers of the onion, and um, you know for for this alcoholic the core of that onion has always just always been fear, you know, fear that I'm not going to get something that I want or fear that I'm going to lose something I have, you know. And uh, no matter how many times you do that, you get, like, a little reticent to go speak because you're like, now I have to rehash all the BS that I <laughs> had to go through to get to where I am today, which is fine, whatever. So the last time, pick up the phone. They're like, you got your insurance is running out. You got to call. Get a call. Find out a place. Find a place to go. So I called my I called, no, My mom wasn't picking up. My stepdad wasn't picking up. My real father wasn't picking up. My aunts and uncles picked up. They're like, you're crazy. You need to go to Napa. My grandparents were like, yo, we don't want you around. There's no place for you here. Uh, cousins, they were like, nah, you need to go to Napa. You're crazy. You don't know how to, like, you don't, you don't know how to live life. You, you just need to be committed forever. And, uh, so what they decided to do was throw me in juvie f- until I turned 18. I thought that was extremely unfair. And, uh, I'm going to be remanded into state, co- uh, uh, county, county custody because there's nowhere for me to go. That's not fair. And, uh, I just wanted to drink some more. And I thought to myself, I was like, you know, if I could just get out of here, from the time I was four years old, I knew that I was going to live under this bridge, and I already had the big bridge picked out by my house around the court, around the way where, where, I, where I was from, and I was going to hang out with this one dude until he died because he already had emphysema, and God knows what else. My mom gave me the whole rundown on, on August and where, where he was going to, you know, how, where he stashed his booze, where he got his drugs, where pe- where he could uh, spend money, get money, and all that. So I had it all figured out. I'm going to get the cost. Uh, what was it? Pay less. The Payless uh, shopping cart, and I'd follow him around, get a dirty jacket, like duster, like this, grow my beard out with long, long hair, and wear some sunglasses, look like a big Lebowski. It'll be fine. It'll be great. Um, and so at that point, I was like, that's it. That's that's really all I had to look forward to. And I, I ended up getting visited the last time I was locked up at Juvie. This guy, Jeff, I was trying to remember his last name, and I can't remember his last name, but his first name was Jeff. And this guy had like this, this stare in his eyes, like the way he'd look at you. You could see he was just looking right through every single, like, every layer of bullshit that you could come up with. Like, any excuse or anything you thought that you, you wanted him to believe about you, he'd just see right through it. And he was kind of scary, but he was real thin, right? And he had, like, this fucking mean mullet. He had, like, this crazy mullet and, like, super sharp, like, spikes in the front of his head. He was, like, super <laughs> sketchy, piercing blue eyes, like, little ripper thin, like, mustache, like, pinner mustache with a little tiny goatee. But real chappy, you know, real happy and chipper. He said, I'm, I'm here to give you a first chance at life, dude. And I'm like, well, okay, just get me out of here. I don't want to be in jail. I'll do whatever you say. He says, I'll take you to treatment. I'll take you to treatment. I said, let's go. Let's go. He says, do you, are you willing to go to San Francisco? And I was like, well, San Francisco? Well, I, you know, I had used in this, like, little four-block, two-block radius that I grew up in forever. <laughs> and then he wants me to come up with him to some huge city. And that was, like, the first moment of clarity for me. I was like, okay. I know if I keep doing what I've always done, I'm going to continue to get what I've always gotten. That was the first moment of clarity. (laughs) No one had to tell me that. It was instantaneous. If I keep doing what I've always done, I will continue to get what I've always gotten. i got to do something different. And in in a different way of thinking about it, like for me, someone described it years later, would you, uh, like a a computer gets a virus, would you expect that computer to heal itself of its own virus? No, that's insane. Like, no computer's going to be able to rectify its own internal, you know, anomalies on its hard drive. You need an outside entity, right, for me, that's God, the steps, but an outside entity to rectify that part. It's Kaspersky or whatever virus protection you want to put on the computer, wipe it clean and get it healed, right? Well, that's how I deal with my alcoholism. I have to invite God in to ask for help and, and, and work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, at that point, I was like, dude, I'll do whatever you say. Bear in mind... I hadn't been anywhere out of that little tiny four block radius that I, you know, did drugs and ran. And this one time, my dad was my real father found me in on the front lawn in my underwear, and I don't know how long I'd been there, like maybe a day and a half. And he was like, "Mijo, what's wrong?" And I'm like, "Dude, turn the helicopters down!" Like that's what I thought. I said. He's like, "What's wrong with you?" And I remember there were a couple times we got to high together, but like he just reminded me is. 
He's like, you were laying there in your chonies, mijo, and you like, you scared me. I didn't know what was wrong with you, and you were really high. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, all you could say was turn the helicopters down. <laughs> so do you want me to take you to the hospital? I'm like, no, just turn them down. Like, you're having, a, you're never too young for a Vietnam flashback. Anyway, um, so. I come, I come to the city, and I go to this pre- treatment program with this dude, and I had to agree five things. Don't do these five things. Don't hurt anybody. So I couldn't touch anybody. I was like, okay, all right, well, okay. <sighs> I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, making a solemn oath, not to hurt anybody, you know? So, okay, yes, whatever you say, okay. And then you cannot have sex with anybody in this program. Yes, I promise. I promise. Okay, you cannot have knowledge of anybody else doing these things. I promise I won't I won't hold anybody's mud, right? And then you couldn't leave and you couldn't get high. Obviously, the other two uh, things that you couldn't do in the structure and program. So, I go to the structure and program. And there was a guy, I come through the door, I'm walking to the door, I'm like, my life is over, I have all these thoughts, right, Tip o'clock, all the thoughts, what's going to happen to me, where am I going to go, what's life, what's life going to look like, I know I'm not going to get my way, and it's going to suck, and I'm going to have to do a bunch of shit that's uncomfortable, and I'm really scared, because I don't want to do that stuff, whatever it is, so I'm thinking all these stuff, saying things, and all these things, 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 and I walk through the front door, and I see this guy I used to do dope with, and I'm like, oh my god, I thought you were dead! And he's all, I heard you were dead, but I heard you killed your mom first, and then killed yourself! I'm like, what, dude, what's up? So we, like, bro down super hard, right? I was like, how long you been in here? I heard you died. He's all, I heard you died! Like, we did that a couple times. And, uh, you know, turns out he got, you know, shipped up to this program. And we became super close. And we got to, like, re-know each other in a different way. Not, obviously, the let's get let's get ripped way. <laughs> Do some crimes. But, like, like, let's get to know each other. And um, so I ended up getting really close with this dude. But he broke the rules. And so this was, like, my first test, right, in sobriety to try something different. And this cat had done, like, one, two, three, three of the things we were all supposed to not do and was not telling anybody about it. And I was like, okay, you got to do something about that, bro. And, and about this time, I was six months... Okay, so after getting sober, we there, I wasn't really exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I wasn't even allowed to touch a light switch or make a phone call or uh, pick up a pen or do anything without asking permission. This is how strict this place was. And this is exactly what I needed. Um, and if you did anything out of turn or didn't ask for permission, blah, 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 you got stood up in front of, like, woken up at, like, 1, 2 in the morning. Maybe maybe if they're feeling really messed up, they'll wake you up at 3 until everybody's in a deep sleep. Hit, hit the intercom. Boop, you know, call everybody, get up, go report to this place on silent treatment. Everybody's looking down like a zombie, walking single file line to the, the big meeting room. Everybody sits down. They wait like 10, 15 minutes. Then they ask you, stand up, go stand in the front of the room. You go up there and they're like, do you know why we're down here? And you're like, oh God, not again. Then the whole house, all 100 kids hate you for like a week. You know, it's so <laughs> very, very like, you know, geared towards uh, augmenting your behavior. <laughs> So this happened all the time, obviously, because I'm me. And I would always get, like, you know, midnight house meetings or one in the morning house meetings constantly for every little thing that I did. Because I was like, fuck the rules. Who cares about the rules? They don't apply to me. Some special. Don't, don't you know? Like, I don't need the rules. And um, so about this time, what my, my friend made a mistake, you know, he's, and he's not owning up to it. I had started going out to AA meetings, and, and, and about this time, I would sit in the back and, like, look around the room and be like, oh, this guy is so lame. Oh, jeez. I don't want to end up like any of these people, right? Like, just sit in the back and character assassinate everybody in the room. So, <laughs> like, chain smoke out the front. Like, they're like, who's got the, who's got the, who's got the reds? Who's got Marlboro reds? Oh, you got camels? All right, I'll take one, whatever. Yeah. yeah, and then, you know, pound the coffee, go to all the meetings all the time, you know, as much as I could, but because you had to, like, sign permission slips to leave the house and do this and do that. Um, anyway. So I go out to uh, these meetings, and I start get, I get a sponsor. I start working the steps. <clears throat> I pick this guy who was from New York. His name was Howie Zowie. Had a great member, Howie Zowie. Howie Zowie was awesome. And he'd tell you all these stories about being in the pit at, at CBGB's and all these guys used to play in a band called Leeway, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so he takes me through the steps. 
And my first four step, I'm like super worried because I don't know if it's that good. I'm like, yo, I didn't write that much. And he's like, don't worry about it. Just write it down. You're going to be fine. Just write it. And I'm like, but I want to be really specific. He's like, yeah, searching and feelers, but that doesn't mean like you take a year to do it, bro. Do it. Next time you got a week to do it, finish it. I don't care what it says. We're going to read it. And that's your fifth step. Boom. Don't worry about it because you're going to come back and do it again. I was like, okay, okay. So that was kind of like one of the first times where I started to trust the process. Like, okay, I'm going to take something from outside myself and in integrate it into here and then start my, you know, in that second and third step we talk about, take my will in my life, which is kind of synonymous with thinking and behavior. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take what my sponsor thinks and how my sponsor behaves and I'm going to think and behave like he does to the best of my ability, right? And so when I do that, I try something new and I get a new result. So did that fourth and fifth step, blah, blah, blah. And I started to practice more honesty in my life. So I told my friend in this program, I said, yo, you need to go tell staff what you did. I know, where, and I feel bad. If you get clapped up, you know I'm going to get clapped up because I'm not supposed to know that you did this stuff and not have said anything, which makes me look bad. And then anybody I've talked to about it, they get clapped up. So we're all going to get clapped up. And if you get kicked out, there's a good possibility that I'm going to get kicked out. Everybody's going to get kicked out. It's not cool. So he's like, nah, I'm not going to say anything. I'm like, dude, all right. And so it took like everything in, in, in me to be like, yo, and I'm 17, I'm 17 years old. I'm still really, really wet. Like I'm like thinking and, and you know, it's not that clear. And, um, I'm still kind of like, I still, it could go either way. Right. And, uh, I told the guy, I got 10 minutes. I'll take, I'll go, I'll go downstairs with you and I'll hold your hand while you tell the staff what you did. And I, I will sit there and we'll do this together. I'll do this with you. And he was like, nah, I don't want to do it. I'm like, okay, so you have 10 minutes. If you don't go in 10 minutes, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to tell him. He's like, no, you can't do that. That's a dry snitch. I'm like, I'm telling you right now, bro, it's going down. It's going down in 10 minutes, and you can either come with me or I can do it myself. But I'll give you a warning before I go down there. And so he ended up wanting to go, and he was really scared. And, you know, he, we did it together. I, I, and so, like, I got to be a part of his recovery in that way. And he told, and he didn't get kicked out, and it ended up being okay. It was squashed. But then he went and did it again, and then he got kicked out later. So, <laughs> like a good alcoholic, right? <laughs> he was like, didn't want to change it. Fine, whatever, you know. Uh, so, and I don't know if he ever got sober again. And um, so I tell that story because the people that we love, that we, we have in our lives that we care a lot about, that we know that need this program, they may or may not know that they need this program, and they may or may not stay sober, and they may, not, may or may not live. I've recently buried somebody that was sober and, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out, and just couldn't pick a side, you know, pick a side. And she couldn't pick a side, and she's dead now. And I recently had uh, another close friend of mine who had a year and couldn't pick a side and was having thoughts and didn't say anything. And this is, like, something that I've worked on in my sobriety in early first 10 years. It was a difficult way to ask, how to ask for help. Like, how do I ask for help? Like, it's hard. That phone weighs like 500 pounds. Like, punching those numbers in that while well, I'm doing that because that's how, that's when I got sober. We saw those phones. <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, picking up that 500 pound phone, you know, and punching somebody's number and be like, hey, what's up? It's Tony. Uh, one more time. Uh, I feel bad. Uh, I want to drink. I want to use whatever. So it's hard to ask for help because inside, like, I haven't always felt worthy of asking for help, right? Like, so I don't have, like, that self-esteem. I don't know about anybody else when you got here, but when I got here to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had no self-esteem. I had zero self-esteem. And some people have low self-esteem when they get here, but I, like, I just really did not feel any kind of way about myself at all. And, um, you know, my stepfather would tell me stories about Vietnam and, like, how, you know, people would just throw themselves in harm's way. And I'd be like, not me, man. I'd just jump into that fucking helicopter rotor and be like, fuck it. Like, I don't I don't care. My life doesn't matter. You know, head first into danger. Like, I don't, who cares? Um, and so, that you know, that's really how I felt, hence the suicide attempts and, and the way I drink. Um, so, you know, getting, getting into uh, that program was the best thing that ever happened to me. And that was, that marked the beginning of this lifelong path. So in, in step one, you know, I got a chance to say, look, you know, my life is unmanageable. There's nothing I can do. I cannot drink to good effect. Okay, fine. Done deal. Understood. Second step, look, maybe if I do something different, like there's some hope, right? In the second step, that spiritual principle of hope blossoms into faith in the third step. When I ask God, invite God into my thinking and my behavior, please direct my thinking and behavior. And then step four, I'm going to get transparent and honest and naked about what it is, what is the contents of my brain? What am I thinking why am I running on fear? Am I run like it's like putting sugar in your gas tank? Am I running on fear or am I running on God? Right? Like, am I allowing God to enter all my affairs? I'm like trusting God to take care of me in all my affairs. Like, God took care of my alcohol problem. Yes, no, yes. He took care of your finances. Yes or no? Yes. Then why are you trying to wrangle your housing situation? 
Like, do you not trust him to take care of your housing situation? Really, bro? Like, are you still trying to run the show? So, <laughs> yeah, right. No, believe that. I'd still do that stuff around dumb stuff. Like, the bet is not answering my phone call. My dog is very sick. I need to vote, you know, whatever. Ad infinitum. Whatever it is. If I can try to control it or, like, you know, strong arm it, I will. Until it doesn't work anymore. And then, in five, saying that stuff to another human being, my sponsor, writing it down, getting honest about it. And then I've done, like, a bunch. Of, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I love my sponsees. Like, I've taken, my uh, the, like, four or five of them, maybe six in the last year and a half through the four, four and five process. And um, it's just so miraculous to watch people, like, do it. They're like, yeah, this sucks. I've got, like, I'm no faith in this process whatsoever. Cool. Do it anyway. Totally fine. Don't care how you feel about it. Put the words on, put pen to paper and see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Whatever I got. And they go through the motions, go through the motions. And then there's like this relief that people get. They're like, wow, I feel different about my life and where I'm going and what I've done and how they just feel different about the sobriety. Um, and I'll never forget that I had a sponsor named Joe. It was in San Francisco, a year of Buena Gardens. And it was a nice sunny day. It was a little cool. I did my fourth and fifth step with him. And he made me read my, my character defects. And he made me read the character opposite, right? The, the opposites, which are like spiritual principles. They're just the opposites of your character defects, right? So he made me read them all. And then he made me read the other ones. He says, these can't exist without these, right? They're both inside of you, right? And you're not a good dude and you're not a bad dude. Do you see that? I said, yeah. He said, you're not a saint. You're not, these don't make you a good guy. I said, yeah, I understand that. He said, I'll make you a piece of shit. I said, yeah, I understand that. He's like, so they kind of equally each other out. They come together and congeal to form who you really are. And so from this point forward, you're free to just be okay. I started crying. I wept. I don't know how long I wept, but I felt so much relief. And they were like one of the first or second times in, I remember in early sobriety where I, I felt joy. Like while I was crying, I, felt, I was just like this immense relief. And they talk about that in the literature, that we don't struggle to the top of the heap or, like, try to hide beneath it. But we find, like, right-sizedness in God's eyes. Like, when we get real about what's really happening and what we're running on, and I take an accurate appraisal and take stock of what's happening inside, we find this, like, equanimity, this mysterious, like, fourth dimension. We get, like, rocketed into this fourth dimension. And it's really trippy. Like, I find myself, like, a lot that way these days. Also, I quit smoking six days ago, so I'm, like, kind of loopy. But I feel like real, like, yeah, I'll probably smoke again. Don't worry. I'm an alcoholic. Right? Don't clap. Don't clap. But, but being placed in a state of neutrality, right? Like, I really feel like I haven't sworn off, you know, cigarettes like I did with I You say we, we didn't sworn off alcohol. I haven't sworn off. I haven't made a solemn oath. But God has done for me what I couldn't do for myself. Really. Truly. Like, I really just, I knew what needed to be done, right? You take the steps, and then you let go of the results. And that's really how my sponsors over time in AA have taught me how to live my life in AA. Is you do the footwork, and then you leave the results up to God. Um, real quick, I got 10 minutes left. So, um, moving on to uh, 6 and 7, right? So, like, 6 and 7, it was described to me, and it's been my experience, that, like, shortcomings are, like, getting in a car with square wheels and expecting a smooth ride. Like, or getting into a relationship with another half a person. Like, I'm half a person, they're half a person. We should make a whole person to get right. Like, <laughs> right, wrong. No, no, John Bradshaw, that is not the case. You know, like, road less travel, read a book, bro. No. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then in, in, in uh, eight, like, making a list. So one of the greatest gifts I got from, from Alcoholics Anonymous was the gift of having relationships return to me through, uh, through AA. And step work and, and amends, right? And my mom had shut me out for like 15 years, right? She didn't talk to me. I was dead to her. Uh, there were some things that I did at the very end that were just, you know, really horrendous. Like, you know, 9-11, Osama bin Laden, horrendous, you know, and uh, unforgivable. And so, you know, she was like, I was dead to her, right? And so what happened was... Finally, she came around after 15, 16 years, and I was, uh, she picked up the phone, and I said, I, I want to meet with you, and she said, yes, I'd like that a lot, I'd like to see you, yes, I'd like to see you too, and um, and it was really, really good, I got to do my ninth step with my mom, finally, I think I had about, I don't know, maybe 10 years, 11 years, but like, you know, leading up to that, before I got sober, like, 
I was like a nutbag to her. It was all bad. And she left me in jail. And I remember before I got sober, she left me in jail. The last thing she said to me when I was, I'm not your mother. You're not my son. I don't ever want to see you again. You're dead to me. Don't try to contact me ever again. And like turned a minute about face and went out the door and left me in the cell. And I was like, what have I done? So my mom died like two years ago, three years ago. But before that, I had gotten to like go places with her, have her come visit, stay with me, go out to dinner. I took her out to dinner a bunch of times, made her a bunch of mixtapes with like Terror and Hatebreed and like Earth Crisis and like all these like Slayer. She loves Slayer. So like she'd send me these funny videos of her driving to prison. She worked in a prison. She was a nurse. She'd drive to prison and send me little videos with the music playing in the background. And I'd text her back, bullshit, show me your war face. And she'd be like, she'd be like, what's your war face? And I'd send her a picture. I'd be like, ah, ah, show me your war face. And then she'd send me a picture of her doing that with the <laughs> music playing in the background, the short video. So we were really close. And, um, you know, when she died, I was devastated. And, um, but the cool thing was, was that I got my mom back, you know, and, uh, I felt closer to her. I almost feel like her disowning me the first time was preparatory for her actual death. You know, like God did for me what I couldn't do for myself, which was prepare myself for the, like the eventuality that we all are going to have to deal with, you know, sober or not, like just with our parents, right, as they go. So that was kind of a gimme. I was like, thank you. I see you. I got you, bro. Um, and then, uh, you know, 10 11, 10, 11 are um, amazing. Uh, making those amends was really good. I'm, I don't want to skip over that, but I just, like, I had to, you know, a lot of people told me, too, like, family members were like, you could say you're sorry, you could, you know, oh, we don't want to, the proof is in the pudding. They're like those kind of folks, you know, oh, the proof is in the pudding. Or, like, they come and lean at you, like, whisper in your ear, if it doesn't come out in the wash, it comes out in the rinse. And then, like, keep moving. I'm like, what? What? What, what is your deal with me, you know? So they're all, like, weird. My family's kind of weird like that. They're real, like, microaggression weirdos. Not overt. Like, I guess I, that's why I was so overt, like, aggressive-aggressive, because everybody else is, like, so surreptitious and, like, <laughs> slinky and snake-like and, like, you know, backbiting, like, you know, little me-me, like that at the dinner, you know, holiday dinner, me-me, like, wedging in the knife. See, man. So, yeah, so, um, and then uh, 11, somebody told me once, like, I bet you can't shut up for 10 days. And I was like, okay, you're on. So I signed up for a free 10-day silent meditation retreat because I was on the 11th step and it was the best thing I ever did. Oh my God. And, uh, I did a couple after that. Amazing. Amazing. And I felt like afterwards that, you know, I got to do a fourth and fifth step, but like times 10 during that 10 day, uh, just like really, really like clear. It was trippy when I came out of that, out of that space for 10 days, not talking to anybody like my, all my attention turned inward, like folding my attention in on itself, in on itself, in on itself. And, uh, coming out of that, like, the first day we were allowed to talk to people and I like looked around and I was like, who do I talk to? I don't want to talk to anybody. And it wasn't because I didn't want to talk to anybody. It was because the sound of my voice was abhorrent, if that makes any sense. So, uh, yeah. And then 12, having had a spiritual awakening, um, as a result of working these, these steps, uh, we sought to carry this message of hope to all the people in our lives, right? Message of recovery to all, all people in our lives. And I try to do that at work. I cut hair now. And never, I didn't think I'd be cutting hair. Like, when I got sober, I was like, I thought I'd be dead by the time I was 18, straight up. So, like, when they gave me a, a job in recovery to work in treatment with other alcoholics, I was like, cool, whatever. I'll see how long this lasts, right? And so, like, for the next 15 years, that's what I did. I worked in treatment. I was a case manager. Right, it was awesome. I was, like, doling out punishments, writing out treatment plans. Like, dude, let's talk about it in groups. See you in caseload. Go to the bitch. You know, like, you're in trouble. You know, like, doing all this stuff that people did to me, right? <laughs> Riding people, grinding them down. Hey, go sit on the, we had this hard church pew. We had this super hard church pew. And we could sit on it for hours. You could get up and stare at the ground. Hunched over on a hard church feet for hours. Thinking about what you did. <laughs> One of the kids would do something really, really not bad. I'd be like, go to the bench. Go to the bench. But I, no, I don't care. Go to the bench. And inside I'm like, ha, 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 ha. It's just fun seeing what the counselors said when they sent me to, this is what, what, what they must have felt when they pushed me over the edge. 
bitch. She's gonna sit on the bench. Oh my god. But then yeah, that changed. I had to go do like, you know, uh, I got fired from every single job. Couldn't take a hit. Now I look back on it, right? God was like, this is not what you're supposed to be doing, bro. You're fired. Get out of here. I'd be like, oh, I gotta find another job in treatment. Treatment. Uh, I, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll go over here, yeah. So I get a job, work there three years, I get fired again. I'm like, come on, man, what? I just, yeah, I gotta find another job in treatment. Like I couldn't take a hit, right? So I kept going back. <laughs> I'd call up people, hey, what's up? Oh yeah, we got an overnight position. Oh yeah, we got a, a front case manager position. Oh, we got this. Couldn't take a hit. And it wasn't until. One of my sponsees was like, hey, you like lifting weights? I'm like, yeah, it's cool, whatever. That's what I do for fun. He's like, want to come chop trees down with me? And I'm like, uh, no. And he's like, it's really good. You get a good workout and you get paid. I'm like, okay, oh, whatever. So I went and did that, fell in love, did it for three years, chainsaws, ah, screaming at people, climbing trees, you know. Not my will. That's where God wanted me, right? Like, <laughs> my sponsee was a suggestion, right? At the end of the three years, not happy, so I had to make another change. And that's, like, one of the great things about Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me that I don't have to commit to something forever, ever, ever. I can just do what's right right now in front of me and, like, trust that that's going to be enough. And that whatever I need, God will invariably give me what in due time. That I don't need to worry about outcomes of things because I'm here to be of service. And that's it. Like, really, I'm not here to do anything other than carry a message of hope. Give what so freely given to me. And I do it at work. Like, I cut hair now. So whenever ta- somebody talks to me about a spouse who drinks too much, I go tell me more. Well, I still cut their hair. Yeah? Uh-huh. And he came home drunk again? Oh, no. <laughs> mm-hmm. He did what? Oh, how'd that make you feel? You know? It's like it's do. The AA work at work, right? <laughs> Be the head of AA in all your affairs. And, you know, I keep those little cool tabs. I don't think you guys got them here, but the little handout thingies, the yellow things, that, they say, like, why we were chosen. You know, have you ever read that? Those are great ones. It's a little handout. There's another one. Yeah, read it. If you haven't seen it, get it central office. They're 10 cents. It's a little fold-out thing. It's called Why We Were Chosen. It's dope. So dope. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I read that. I was like, boo, mind blown. So I keep a stack of those and some other ones, some of the serenity prayer ones in my little thing at work. And then somebody, sometimes somebody will come in and they'll be talking about something. I'm like, oh, yeah? You know about AA? Oh, yeah. You've seen that show? Mm-hmm. Okay. They talk about AA on that show? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and leaning them all. I've been sober for 26 years. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. The whole shop already knows. Like, no one cares, right? But it makes them feel special. They're like, oh, yeah? Really? Why? Why? I'm like, because I was a fuck up. You know, like, I'm just like, you, know, you get to tell little bits of your story all day long. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm living the dream today. Like, seriously, like, I, I, I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. Like, I, I, if you'd have told me when I first got sober that my life would be like this, it's what I have to do or get to do every day, I would not have believed you at all. And everything is, like, perfect. And like I said, I've kind of been placed, what it's like today is it's just, living in a place of neutrality and that um, I feel like when I get that, like, I don't know about you guys, but I get like these bursts of like, what's coming next? What's coming next? I get like this anticipatory, like, we're, we're, what's going on? Right? Like, do you guys get that? You get that sometimes? Like, what are we doing next? What, what's going on? Or like, what's happening next week? You guys don't get that? <laughs> So I get that, like, all day long, and I have to, like, calm myself down. So there's, like, a couple different ways. First is prayer. Like, okay, thank you, God. Thank you so much for my life, right? There's nothing to do, and let me just settle into this feeling of anticipation. Acknowledge it and see how long it lasts, right? I don't have to do anything behind it. I don't have to have a cigarette. I don't have to drink. I don't have to self-destruct. I don't have to blow up my life because I have a feeling. Like, I just acknowledge it and see what happens, and um, that's pretty much like, you know, what life is like now. And, and I just do what's right in front of me. I brush my teeth. I take my showers. I pay my bills on time. I'm a citizen. It's weird. It's really weird. Because I still want to blow things up. And I still want to, like, shoot holes in things and, like, blow, you know, take chainsaws and stuff. But that's just, you know, they're passing thoughts. They're like clouds in the sky. They're like Bob Ross paints a painting and then it's gone. You know, it's not, like, there forever. I don't have to do something about it. So anyway, thank you. If you didn't hear what you needed to hear tonight, please go to another meeting. And uh, thank you for letting me be of service.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.